Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve ashabihi ecma'in ve ba'du. Welcome to the Friday halaqa in which we try to take a, a more of a thematic, semantic uh, approach to the Qur'an. Um, we take sort of a glimpse on each surah to look at the central theme and how the other sub-themes connect to the central theme. Uh, we have reached the beginning of Surah Al-An'am, which is Surah number 6 in the Qur'an. And interestingly, if you look at the surahs that we dealt with, the five surahs that we dealt with, Surah Al-Fatiha at the beginning is actually a Makki surah. Uh, it was revealed in Mecca before Hijrah. Uh, then we have Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran, and Nisa, and Al-Ma'idah. All of them are Madani surah. They were revealed after Hijrah. They're long surahs. They're the biggest surahs in the Qur'an. And now here we come to a Makki surah. So we're returning here to a Makki surah. So sort of the Quran starts briefly with a Makki surah. Then there's a, a long stretch of Madani surahs, uh, which is about uh, six juz and, and a quarter of a juz. Six and a quarter of a juz. And that's, that's quite a lot. And then it goes back to Makki. So we have Surah Al-An'am, Makki, Makki, and Surah number 7, which is Al-A'raf, also is a Makki surah. So let's look at Surah Al-An'am in general. What does it reveal? What does it talk about? Just like all of the other Makki surah, and to give you a, a glimpse on or an idea of what Makki surahs deal with, and they have a lot in common. Uh, look at the majority of the surahs, the short surahs, in Juz Amma, Juz Tabaraka, Juz 30, Juz 29, you'll find a lot of them talk about Allah, about articles of faith, about the Day of Judgment, about the Quran, about the validity of the message of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that it's an authentic message, that he's a real prophet and messenger, um, and about the, about the consequences on the Day of Judgment, and about our covenant and agreement with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and the reward for the believers and punishment for the disbelievers. Surah Al-An'am is no exception. It just emphasizes the concept of Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is something that consistently appears in Surah Al-An'am, which is it emphasizes the validity of the message of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa There's a lot of argument and debate with disbelievers as to why the message of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the real one. Sometimes it appears in the form of a logical discussion. Sometimes it appears with more of threat um, with what what the consequences, long-term consequences are going to be on the day of judgment and that's the hellfire, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the for disbelievers. Um, and also it talks about the reward obviously for, for the believers. Uh, and sometimes it actually uh, turns their attention to the creation of Allah uh, in the in the universe and how it actually points to the Lordship of Allah that He's the Creator, He's the Sustainer, He's the He's the Almighty, and that we came from Him and it necessitates logically that since He created us, we came from Him and we are dependent on Him, we are in need of Him for everything and we are going to return to Him, that we actually turn our hearts towards Him, that we worship Him. Uh, it's it's just it's a very it's a very obvious it's a very obvious logic and it's already embedded within us it's built in the human psyche in the form of of a fitra there's a lot of uh, utilization of this natural concept within humans then Allah shows how the people who don't pay attention to this and people who refuse to a appreciate this and give it a chance that they are actually deaf and blind. So let's start um, with, uh, so today is some sort of an introduction to the surah and I will try to maybe cover the first um, five pages, probably the first five pages, around the first five pages. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the surah with praise, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, just like surah, uh, surah al-fatiha, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. This one is a, is a, an, a different version, alhamdulillahi alladhi khalaq as-samawati wal-arda wa ja'ala al-dhulumati wal-nura thumma al-ladhina kafaru bi rabbihim ya'dilun. Alhamd. We spoke about Alhamd previously. It's been a while, so it's good to talk about it here again. We usually translate it as praise, but Alhamd is far, far more than praise. P praise is just, I would say, part of it. It's a small outcome of what the meaning of Alhamd really means. Alhamd means you acknowledge and you celebrate the 
the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. He's perfect in himself. He's perfect in his attributes. He's perfect in his actions and in what he does. Uh, so when you say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, you're saying everything with Allah is perfect. Everything with Him is perfect. Everything about Him is perfect. His names are perfect. His attributes are perfect. He Himself is perfect. There is there's nothing wrong. There is no blemish. There is no imperfection at all when it comes to Allah. So everything is just perfect. And it's the absolute form of perfection. And everything about His actions, about what He does, what He creates, is perfect so that's when this when you say alhamdulillah so you sort of acknowledge the greatness and the perfection of allah and then you acknowledge the outcomes of this since allah is perfect his names are perfect his attributes are perfect his the things he does are perfect everything he does he does it perfectly um you realize there's no mistakes in this universe Re you realize hey there's nothing is going wrong everything is just happening in the best way according to the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yes there is pain yes there is suffering yes there is discomfort there are things that seem to be um, against what we want and against what we like and against our conveniences but again this is our perspective the reality is everything that comes from Allah is perfect as the Prophet says in the hadith Wal khayru fi yadayk, he addresses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says to Allah oh Allah and goodness is in, in your hand everything is good from Allah and everything from Allah is good, is perfect. So this is why there is a meaning of praise here and there is a meaning of, of gratitude here. We're also saying like, I'm grateful that Allah is in charge, that He is the Lord, that everything comes from Him. I'm grateful that He is the Creator. I'm grateful that He is the Sustainer. I'm grateful that He is the one who wrote the Qadr and the destiny and how things are going to happen i'm just so thankful i'm so grateful um, that this is the case so this is a very basic meaning of the word alhamd alhamdulillah alladhi khalaqa samawati wal ard who created the heavens and the earth the skies and the earth and he's the one who created al dhulumat wal nur the darkness and the light Darkness and light, all of them are the creation of Allah. Everything is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word ja'ala in the Arabic language, sometimes it's, trans it's translated as to make, but ja'ala oftentimes is also used as to create out of nothingness, bring into existence or design something out of existence. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, basically, if you look around, what is the universe? It's the heavens and the earth. That's the creation, the heavens, the skies and the earth. So they include everything that we know about, the universe as we know it and one of its aspects is the light and the darkness and this is just a secret of the creation of Allah uh, I mean people who are in into physics into quantum physics and into the uh, they could actually they could draw a lot just from this simple thing like the nature of light and how it relates to time right and, 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 and we know that light is not just as simple as we know it even, no matter how sophisticated our knowledge of light, physically speaking, is, still there is so many mysteries. The connection between, again, light, time, even gravity, uh, matter and energy and light. What is the connection? There's a lot of secrets out there. Even quantum physics tries to uncover some of that and has uncovered some. But... There is so many secrets in the universe and what we humans manage to get to is actually a very small fraction of the reality of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. Then Allah says, after all of this magnificent creation, after all of this perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And thus he created the heavens and the earth and the darkness and the night, then definitely all of that is a perfect design. It's a clear design. Perfect design in the sense that it serves its purpose. Because sometimes people say, you know, but if you look at the universe, there are natural disasters. So how, how is that perfect? Well, there is a purpose for which Allah created and designed the universe. And the universe is perfectly fulfilling that purpose. So that's what perfection means. Now, we cannot hijack the purpose of the universe and say, oh, it had, if it doesn't meet our expectations or our preferences, it's imperfect. So 
this is a very subtle point but it's it's very good to be aware of it then Allah says هو الذي خلقكم من طين ثم قضى أجلا وأجل مسمى عنده ثم أنتم تمترون he is the one who created you from clay and clay is this moist dirt because it's it, it holds itself together and it's it's it can be molded it's it's flexible it can be shaped um, and that's our origin that's our element and that's the element of our body because humans are made of two elements and that's the body which is from earth dirt it's made of dirt and it has its own characteristics so the concept of desire the concept of uh, again aggression and anger the 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 concept of that we are attracted to base desires that's a function of the fact that we are created from the element of this earth but the other element is the soul and the soul as the scholar said it's a heavenly creature it's 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 it comes from from the skies from above so and it displays the characteristics of heavenly creatures and that's that's where the the test of humans actually is and this is where human human nature is, is is very interesting and it's very intricate so Allah says he created you in terms of physically from clay and then Allah set a time or an appointment and that's basically there's there's some words from the scholars as to what exactly so there is two appointments here there is two sort of deadlines here Allah says ثم قضى أجلا وأجل مسمى عنده so the first appointment, there's two reference to two appointments here. First one is actually, it seems to be it's the death. It's 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 your it's your birth into this world and then the time of your death. That's set by Allah. That's not going to change, by the way. It's already been set. So it was written fifty thousand years before the creation of the heavens and the earth, and it's going to happen according to the plan and the script of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there is another appointment and that's when you are resurrected and when you stand before your Lord on the day of judgment for the account. That's the second appointment. All of that is designed by Allah. So look at that. Like your environment, your home, the, the, the world in which you live is designed by Allah for you in preparation for your existence, for your, for your advent into this world. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. And Allah also appointed, made appointments. Everything has been set. These appointments have been set. Everything is set up. And you as a human being, no matter how intelligent you get or how resourceful you become or how much technology you, you, you manage to, to develop, you will never be able to change those basic facts about life and about reality there is there's a certain there's a small range where you can play where you can play with and use your, your intellectual capacity and your science and your development and your civilization and, and 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 your might and your power whatever Allah has given you these resources but they are just a small limited range as to the set facts of life they don't change they're in the hands of Allah and you are just a you are an object upon which these forces will act as they are designed. ثُمَّ أَنْتُمْ تَمْتَرُونَ Allah says, then after all of this, you're doubting the existence of Allah. Again, this shows again the futility of this um, uh, atheistic argument or, or, or way of thinking today that shows that it's basically, it's more of a trance. It's, it's a very, um, it, it, it is a, how can I say, it, it's a trance on a, on a, on a huge scale. And humans are open to this kind of hypnot uh, hypnosis. They are they are open to this kind of influence. Uh, humans, unless they awaken within themselves their fitrah and their sense of responsibility, and they start searching and for themselves and really looking for the truth, nothing nothing but the truth. Uh, unless they do that, it's easy for them to be programmed, to be brainwashed, to be hypnotized by the culture, by the media by any kind of influence, especially when uh, momentum is created among the masses, it's very easy just to flow with the tide. So Allah says, then after all of the, this, it's so clear, then after all of this, you are doubting, you're doubting. And here Allah left it open, you're doubting. You're doubting what? Many things. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they were doubting the oneness of Allah, that he's the only one who has the right to be worshipped. Uh, they were doubting, some of them were doubting as will, will be apparent in the surah in surah al-an'am uh, some of them were denying that there will be a next life 
some of them were doubting the message of the Prophet ﷺ that he's really a prophet from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it was left open to to cover all of these types of doubt. And today as as, as we see it's more than any time uh, in the known in the in the in the known history that humans uh, in in great numbers there are people who espouse and embrace you know the denial of the existence of Allah altogether in in uh, at this scale. Then Allah says, "Wa huwa Allahu fi samawati wa fi al-ard yalamu sirrakum wa jahrakum wa yalamu ma taksibun." He is the only one who deserves to be worshipped because Allah as a name, it has a meaning. There is semantics behind it, and what that means. Allah means the only one who has the right to be worshipped because Allah means Al-Ilah which comes from Ilaha or Alaha. Alaha is to worship. Al-Ilah, the one who's worshipped, the one who the only one who's worshipped in truth, and that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah says and he is Allah in the heavens and the in the heavens and the earth, that means he's the one who's worshipped in the heavens and the earth in truth. He's the only one who's worshipped in truth. Any other gods, because people worshipped many things, people worshipped cows. Rats, dogs, uh, people worshipped statues, stones, trees. Then people worshipped celestial bodies. That's from the heavens, right? Sun, the moon, stars, planets, uh, etc. Uh, so Allah says, no one is actually worshipped. All of these are creation of Allah. No one is worshipped in truth. The only one who is worshipped in truth anywhere, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows what you hide. He knows the most intimate secrets that no one knows about. And what's interesting as well, that he actually knows the secrets in you that you yourself are not aware of. Because as humans, again, we are a mystery to ourselves. We don't know ourselves very well. And we go through this life figuring things out about ourselves. So it gets to a point where we know only so much. But there are so many things, so many secrets about us that we don't even know. And uh, we will never exhaust or never reach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still knows knows that and he knows what you reveal the things that you show and display so he knows them they are similar to Allah there's no difference between what you conceal and what you reveal he's not bound by what we are bound with we humans we are bound by limits of time limits of um, space uh, right I, I, couldn't, I couldn't possibly know what you have in your mind now what you're hiding in your mind some people have a sense of intuition, some kind of insight. They might know some, but there are so many things they don't know about you. But for Allah, He just knows. He knows everything. And He knows what you earn. He knows what you earn. And He knows what you are going to earn. So He knows it all. He knows it all. But He allows you, instead of holding you accountable for what He knows about you, which is just going to be true, He allows you to go through the experience. So that you see for yourself and you see Allah's justice. That he's not going to tell you, I know you're going to do bad things or evil things. I know you're going to disbelieve. I know you're going to, you are going to commit crimes. So I'm going to just give you, you know, what you truly deserve. You know, still humans are very argumentative. As Allah says in many surahs, for example, in Surah Al-Isra, Allah says, وَكَانَ الْإِنثَانُ إِنثَانُ أَكْثَرَ شَيْءٍ جَدَلًا Man is the most argumentative of creatures. So people would, some people would start to say, oh, but... You know, I didn't do anything. Why would you, uh, why would you send me, for example? Why would you punish me, right? So Allah says, no, we're going to give you the full experience. So on the day of judgment, you are the witness against yourself. Then verse number four, Allah says, وَمَا تَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهَا مُعْرِضِينَ And any sign that comes to them from Allah, any verse, any sign, it could be a verse from the Quran, or it could be any sign in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on or events occurrences and it's a sign and it points it's a pointer it points to Allah it points to the truth that's what ayah is so uh, any sign that comes to them from their Lord their attitude their response to it is Illa kanu anha they are they're turning away from it they're trying to avoid it A'rad is to turn to turn away from something, to try to avoid, be avoidant of something. So they are avoiding. And that shows the psychology of disbelief. What leads people to reject the truth even though part of them recognizes it, which is the fudra, right? And that's basically, there's an attitude. There's something they desire. There's something they want. And when that seems to be jeopardized by 
the truth by the signs of Allah, they sort of don't want to see it. So they pretend they don't see it, or they ignore it altogether, or they turn away from it, or they come up with an argument just to explain it away, and so on and so forth. So all of these things, Allah says, that's the attitude. So when the signs come to them, there's already plenty of signs, yet still Allah sends more signs out of His mercy uh, to His people, to His creation, and yet they turn away from these signs. The signs are already there, by the way. There's no need for more signs, but again, Allah still gives more than humans really need. Then Allah says, so the reality of their state, and this is this is a point that's going to come up uh, many times in Surah Al-An'am, is that there is an essence, there is a human essence, and this human essence is Allah gave us choice as to how it, it ends up being, or how what it's going to be. And this essence, from this essence, every all, all our behavior, uh, comes from that essence all of our attitudes all of our life as it's played out all of our personal traits come from that essence so Allah gave us the capacity humans to choose our essence it's a very subtle process but we're going to choose that and so whoever chooses to be a good of a good essence these people deserve paradise because paradise is good it's the place is the house of goodness so you have chosen your destiny whereas People who choose to be of a bad or evil essence, there is the hellfire. That's 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 the house of evil. So you're gonna gravitate to the to the to the hellfire. Jazah and wifaqa is a very fair um, uh, recompense, and Allah gives humans this capacity to choose their essence. Now everything in our life is just a reflection of that essence. It's this essence being played out. This is the reality of, you know, of what we do. And this life, by the way, this life does not misguide the guided or guide the misguide uh, or misguide the guided, etc. It doesn't. What what this life does, and we we mentioned, you know, what this world does. It just does and serves what it was the purpose it was created for perfectly, and what this life was designed for with everything in it. What it was designed for is to reveal the reality of humans. What's that essence? It is to reveal what that essence of humans is. What is the one they chose to be? What kind of essence they chose to themselves? And this is a unique choice Allah gave humans. Because angels don't choose their essence. It's already been decided for them. Same with almost every other creature. But humans, Allah gave them a choice. And it's a very powerful choice. Is they choose either to be of a good essence or bad essence. Because Allah gave them this, again, this earthly element, which is the, 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 the clay, the body, physical body. And Allah gave them the soul, which is a heavenly body. And that mixture of these two elements could potentially go either into more of a heavenly creature, leaning more towards a heavenly creature, where the dirt is elevated to that, the dirt is elevated uh, to this heavenly nature, or the opposite, this heavenly nature is actually uh, contaminated and completely transformed into an earthly uh, element. So that's what this life does. It just reveals what you truly choose deep down for yourself with regards to your essence. So Allah says, then these people, what they have done, the reality is verse number five. They have just disbelieved in the truth. They have rejected the truth when it has come to them. They will receive, there will come to them what they used to make fun of. And that again shows how the response of uh, rejection is usually displayed in the form of ridicule or mockery. Then Allah says, verse number six: "Alam yarau kam ahlakna min qablihim min qarni makkanahum fil ardi ma'lam nu makkil lakum wa arsalna sama alihim idrara wa jana alanhar tajri min tahtihim fa ahlaknahum bidunubihim wa anshana min baghim qarna akhirin." Allah says, "Didn't they see what happened to nations before? The people to whom we have given so much power, we established them on the earth more than we've established you, and we have made rivers flow for them." And we have sent train upon them, blessings from Allah. And then Allah says, because they disbelieved, they rejected the faith, they rejected the truth, we destroyed them with their sins. 
And then we established another people after them. There's so many, all these previous nations from the time of Nuh, السلام, then the people of Ibrahim, Lut, all of the, the people of the prophets who rejected the, the truth and the, who were punished. Allah says, so Allah here shifts the conversation. Don't they see now Allah established something? Then he says, okay, maybe some kind of fear will wake some people up. Uh, then Allah says, وَلَوْ نَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ كِتَابًا فِي قِرْطَاسٍ فَنَمَسُوهُ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ لَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ Number seven. Allah says, and had we sent down a book, just a physical book to you, O Muhammad, like they saw that book descending from heavens, coming to you, O Muhammad, and they touched that book with their hands, physically, like tangibly, they, they touched that book. Still, the disbelievers would not believe. Why? Because it's the essence that's going to be reflected. It's not a matter of, hey, there is sign, we need a new sign. The signs are already there. It's the essence just revealing itself. So those people would still, even if this miracle happened, they would still disbelieve and they would say, hey, this is magic. This is not real. And then another point as well with regards to the fact that only the essence of humans reveals itself. Uh, Allah says here number eight and nine, uh, because some of them said the messenger should have been an, an angel so that we know this angel is from Allah. This is what some of the people of Mecca said to Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Allah says, you know, had we sent down a prophet uh, or a, a, an angel, it would have been over because we send the angels to humans to deal with humans face to face when this life is over. And Allah says, even if we sent down an angel, Without bringing this world to an end, human nature would not be able to handle an angel. So even if we sent an angel, we would have given this angel the form of a man so that humans could communicate with that angel. Somebody might say, why doesn't Allah send an angel and make humans capable of communicating with that angel? Still, there would be no belief. Why? Because the essence is going to reveal itself. So... It's not like we humans, we can come up with an idea better than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already did. And this this requires humility. Um, but again, many of the questions that you hear today, many of the uh, objections that you hear today about people saying, why doesn't Allah do this? Why didn't he do that? All of this just reflects a position of arrogance. Then Allah says to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because the Prophet ﷺ used to feel bad about all of these arguments and about all of this mockery and about them not taking the message seriously and about them rejecting it. Allah says to the Prophet, consoles the Prophet ﷺ in verse number 10. وَلَقَدْ إِسْتُهْزِئَ بِرُسُلٍ بِرُسُلٍ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ فَحَاقَ بِالَّذِينَ سَخِرُوا مِنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ You know, messengers who came before you were ridiculed. They were mocked as well. And the ones who uh, mocked on them, uh, you know, they received the, the, the news that they used to make fun of, which was the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't worry about them. Like the outcome of what they do is really none of your concern because Allah says to the Prophet in another, another place in the Quran, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتِ You do not guide whom you love. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ It's Allah who guides. Then Allah says, uh, again, he draws the attention of humans. Verse number 11. Uh, say to them, O Muhammad, you know, travel through the earth, walk through the earth, and see how the punishment of those who rejected their messengers, how their end was. Look at their ruins and their remains. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to um, sort of have some kind of a discussion with them. قل لمن ما في السماوات والأرض قل لله كتب على نفسه الرحمة لا يجمعنكم إلى يوم القيامة لا ريب فيه الذين خسروا أنفسهم فهم لا يؤمنون. Say O Muhammad, to whom belongs the heavens and the earth? Say to them indeed to Allah, and they knew that. So the Arabs at the time, they were pagans, but still they they knew Allah, but they worshipped others besides Him, and this is something they would approve of. They would acknowledge that yes. Who owns this universe? It's Allah. It belongs to Allah. But the Prophet says, Allah wrote mercy upon himself. Allah committed himself to acting with mercy towards his creation. لَيَجْمَعَنَّكُمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهَا الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُ
an extension or an, an outcome of his mercy is that he's going to gather you for the day of judgment and give everyone what they truly deserve. So what happens on the day of judgment is complete justice and mercy. Because if there's no justice, there's no mercy. When you give bad people and good people the same kind of reward, there's no justice and there's no mercy. Um, so the fact that the evil will be put in the house of evil, which is the hellfire, and the good will be put in the house of good, which is paradise, that's very merciful. That's, what, that's, that's the only manifestation of mercy in that kind of scenario. And it is what justice is. So justice and mercy go hand in hand. There is no contradiction. Some people say, if Allah is merciful, then he shouldn't punish. Well, again, that's a very limited, um, naive view of mercy or what mercy means. Because if you have, let's say, two children, um, or let's say two employees, you're, you're, a, you're, a, you're a manager, you have two employees, they're in similar positions. One of them does the work and the other person is slacking, wasting time. And you eventually give them the same salary, the same bonuses, you treat them the same treatment. That person is, uh, is, is producing a lot for the company, for the corporation. And this person is just wasting resources and wasting time and is costing the organization. You're treating them the same. This is not fair, number one. And also it's not merciful. Because when you equate evil with good, there's no mercy there. You actually establish tyranny in that sense. Um, there's no doubt about, about the Day of Judgment. Those who disbelieve, those who re rejected to believe, they have lost themselves. That's the issue. That shows yourself is a gift from Allah. And you are, it's given an opportunity to live eternally in bliss. But if you reject faith, refuse faith and act with evil, you have lost that opportunity. And you're going to lose yourself in the hellfire. And that's, it's not like a loss, you lost it and it's gone. No, you're going to suffer in that, in that loss for eternity. And that's like, it's like scary. It's, it, 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 it's even hard to, hard to think about how someone is going to, to suffer, you know, eternally. It is so painful. It is unimaginable. Yet we know without a shadow of doubt, it's, it's, it is fair. And then here there's an establishment of Ar-Rububiyya, the Lordship of Allah, the fact that He's the Lord, He's the Creator, He's the Sustainer, He's the Giver, He's the Provider, He's the one who takes care of the creation. That, To Him belongs everything that stays quiet in the night or the day, and He is the All-Hearer, the All-Knower. Uh, again, this is part of Alhamdulillah. The Surah started with Alhamdulillah. And, and the first, I think the first verse is actually the central, holds... Uh, uh, sort of displays the central theme all of this is part of Alhamdulillah um, verse number 14 say shall I take a protector a, a guardian a lord other than Allah uh, uh, someone to worship uh, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he is the originator of the heavens and the earth, he's the, one who, he's the one who brought them into existence and brought everything in them into existence, right? How come I worship something else? Because devotion is to the one who created you. It's, it's ba very basic, obvious lo logic. Well, who are you to he's the one who provides, he's the one who feeds you. And he doesn't stand in need of any food or any sustenance. He's self-sufficient. Say, I was commanded to be the first to submit to Allah and not to be from among those who associate partners. Here's the element of fear as well. If, if that logic, you're blinded to that very basic, simple, obvious, natural, innate logic, then maybe some fear will shake shake you, sh shake your mind around, shake your heart and maybe awaken something in you. The pro say, O oh Muhammad, that I fear, if I disobey Allah, I fear the punishment of a very great day. Whoever is protected from that punishment of the day, the day of judgment, then this is the ultimate form of mercy. This person managed to get Allah's the ultimate form of Allah's mercy, and that is the 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 uh, the ultimate success and the ultimate win. 
وإن يمسسك الله بضر فلا كاشف له إلا هو وإن يمسسك بخير فهو على كل شيء قدير This is verse number 17 And if Allah touches you with harm with what is harmful, what's painful then no one can remove it other than Allah and this is something that we need to know that really who has might and power is Allah and the 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 things that we see, the factors that we see in this life that for example you have pain, you take painkiller the fact that painkiller has an impact is by the design of Allah originally who designed these substances brought them into existence and who guided humans to know these substances and guided humans to be able to manufacture them and make them available so these are causes but these are causes the causes are tools made by the ultimate causer who's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you have to trace everything back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you have a, so you have a balanced uh, and a very grounded understanding of reality you know that you should only turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obviously do whatever you can do physically and if he touches you with good then he's capable of everything that means you know you trace everything back to Allah and you know that everything that comes from Allah must be good we said alhamdulillah right at the beginning everything up from Allah is perfect even though from our perspective as we said it might be painful might not be that pleasant it's just because we are stuck we are captive to our perspective and it's very biased وَهُوَ الْقَاهِرُ فَوْقَ عِبَادِهِ وَهُوَ الْحَكِيمُ الْخَبِيرُ And he is so mighty and powerful. He has control over all of the creation. No one, no, he's the conqueror over his creation. No one can, no one can compete with him. There's, there's, this whole concept is non-existent at all. And he is the wise and he's the all-knowing. He's wise. So, again, the fact that he has this, he's the conqueror, he has the, the power, He's wise as well. He's not he's not a tyrant. He's not going to abuse that power. He has that power. He uses it with wisdom and with knowledge. And with very detailed knowledge and, and grasp of 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 his creation and of everything. Uh, and this basically means this establishes the lordship of Rububi of Allah so powerfully that it makes your heart turn only to him. Because the heart is designed to turn to the one who has the power, who has the might, the one who has the say. You know, when you go to a place, you say, <clears throat> you go to a group of people, you want to influence them, you want to, you want them to buy into something. Who do you go to? The influencer, the one who has power over them, the one who can say, the one who can make a decision. A decision. If you are working in marketing and you want to get a company to purchase your product, let's say, or purchase a device that you, you, you manufacture, you don't go to uh, for example, the, the gatekeeper, you don't go to a driver, you don't go to um, to any of those employees. You go to the supply, ch supply chain uh, manager, etc. Uh, people who are um, responsible for purchasing or for, um, uh, you know, for, for uh, buying equipment and, and so on and so forth. So you go to the decision maker of that. That's a natural human thing, uh, human response. When we humans are really understand and grasp that it's Allah who's in charge, Allah makes decisions. It's the word of Allah that comes true. Things happen because Allah said so. Then we know to turn to no one but Allah. And this frees us from the worship of anything or anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's so much freedom in being a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think it's good to stop here. That was a good introduction into the surah. Inshallah, next week we will carry on. Uh, the surah is very, very strong and very like focused in terms of establishing the truth of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and arguing against disbelievers and exposing their, their arguments. Jazakumullah khairan for joining us and hope to see you inshallah next week. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.